briefly. So this is Alison Faulkner. Uh, she's a survivor researcher and trainer in mental health uh, with over 25 years experience of working in mental health research uh, and consultancy. Right, thanks very much. Um, I guess what I'm going to do is shine a light on uh, just one area really of the mental health field, which is survivor research. So I'm going to start by talking about why, uh, what is survivor research and why I'm coming at it in this way. Um, yes, so I'm thinking about survivor research in the context exactly of many of the things that Harry has just been talking about. Um, these are the, the points I'm going to cover. So I'm going to look at what is survivor research, some of the turning points for myself in terms of thinking about the white privilege, the white whiteness of the, the field in which I am working and, we, and in which all of us are potentially working. <clears throat> and to think about the knowledge production and um, the potential of survivor research at the end. So I'll just talk a little bit about, I, I guess one of the important aspects of, of what I'm going to talk about is, is the intersectionality, which Harry did sort of pass or touch on. And it's thinking about where privilege and, um, where privilege and disadvantage um, intersect in various ways. So starting then from my perspective, I am a survivor, I've used mental health services um, over a period of several years. I'm no longer using mental health services at the moment. So I came into research from the perspective of wishing to forefront the knowledge coming from service users and survivors. And just a couple of years ago, I completed my PhD in the role and value of experiential knowledge in mental health research. So that's the perspective to it in which I'm coming as a white woman, as a gay woman as well. So you can see that in some ways, there is a fair amount of uh, disadvantage in my life as well as, as I come to understand it, very much more privilege. So first of all, what is survivor research? It's insider research undertaken by people with some shared knowledge and experience of the thing being explored. It recognizes experiential knowledge as a valuable source of evidence. It aims to equalize the relationship between the researcher and the people being researched. And in the view of many survivor researchers, and if anyone is interested to follow up on this, there are many writing on survivor research, has the potential to transform knowledge about mental health and to look at it in a different way. It establishes service users and survivors as credible knowers and knowledge producers in our own right. It is undertaken within a context of both powerlessness and privilege. So on the one hand, this kind of research occupies a very powerless position within the context of mental health research, psychiatry. Um, this research of, uh, there's a sort of an evidence, a hierarchy of evidence, which many of you may be familiar with in the research sort of context. And survivor research, does not get funded, is very, very underfunded and, and, and occupies a space of not great deal of credibility within the mental health professional world, critical, uh, uh, clinical, professional, academics world. Equally, however, as I have come to understand, we also have privilege. Some of us have privilege as well. And I think it's understanding those intersectional aspects that um, is what I'm really addressing today. When we undertake survival research, we are seeking to surface the knowledge that has often been um, unobserved. Un and I think if you think about racism, we can see some parallels here. It's about finding ways of ex exploring, surfacing the experiences we've been routinely disbelieved or dismissed while our, our distress has been reduced to symptoms of psychiatric conditions. Neglecting the views and experiences of people who use services, say Glazeby and Beresford, gives a false and potentially dangerous view of the world. And a survivor researcher writing in the book by Morgan and others wrote that telling our stories is both a routine experience and an impossibility. So when we're invited to tell our stories as a, as a patient, um, we're often closed down because what clinicians are looking for are symptoms and ideas of where treatment might take them. 
So a turning point for me was um, an event, an event that was celebrating 10 years of survivor research. And at this event, my friend and colleague, Jay Shri Kalatil, made a presentation. And this was one quotation from her presentation. And I would regard her as a very, very good friend and mentor in my own under understanding and exploration of these issues. Despite talking about the need to be diverse and inclusive, survivor research is by and large a homogenous place which reflects little of the vast array of different experiences, identities, skills and backgrounds that constitute the larger user survivor community. And this room today, she said, reflects this fact. And indeed it did. And the response was silence. No one spoke, no one responded to um, her comment. And it was a very, I think it was perhaps the first time that I had been so excruciatingly aware of the whiteness of the room, the failure then of survivor research, despite wishing to surface the views of people using services, the, the failure of survivor research to realize that we were ignoring or not seeing the voices, the people, the stories that came from the people who are currently and continuously, as Harry's pointed out, being overrepresented in the system and receiving worse outcomes, worse opportunities. Another survivor, activist and um, really profound thinker is Colin King, and I recommend you read his work, said whiteness must not escape structural scrutiny. Sarah Ahmed is an absolutely fantastic speaker, uh, writer, thinker. Whiteness is invisible and unmarked. It's the absent centre against which others appear as deviants or points of deviation. Whiteness is only invisible for those who inhabit it or those who get so used to its inhabitants that they learn not to see it, even when they are not in it. And so I have been reading and thinking along these lines, white privilege. It's an absence of the negative consequences of racism, understanding that it's an absence of funny looks directed at you because you're believed to be in the wrong place. A friend, my, I think it was the same friend, two, people, two of them turned up at a, a conference and were directed to the catering facilities because it was assumed that they were part of the catering staff. And so uh, Robin D'Angelo writes both about whiteness and also about white fragility, a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear and guilt. How dare you raise race again in this, in this forum? That is something I have really experienced. White people feel that raising issues of race is somehow taking up too much space or being used to attack them or to make them feel guilty. And I know a friend, another friend of mine who was um, involved in an ethics committee. She was a member of an ethics committee as a black survivor and she, she kept raising the issue of race. It, it cannot, I mean, you know, I'm jumping ahead to the end of my slides here, but it cannot be left to black people to raise issues of race all of the time because it becomes, um, it becomes then inherent, it, it, the, the, we, we, dis, we, dis, we dismiss the responsibility that we have as a society generally to, under, to understand these issues. And, they, and, and white people generally lack what D'Angelo calls the racial stamina to engage with and understand the issues from a position of humility and openness. So in relating these experiences, I guess I'm describing a move within myself from inclusion towards partnership, from thinking about race and racism to thinking about white privilege and what it means to, about me, what it means for me to be white in this world as a survivor researcher. I know in many ways, I don't have a lot of power. I don't have funding, generally speaking, I, I have to work. But I, I, I know as well that it means being offered work on a range of topics, not being selected solely to work for work that matches my racial group. I am, if you like, the neutral research, survivor researcher, the mainstream, one of the definers of the space. I'm part of the reference group against which the other is being measured. And that is particularly important in the field of research because 
um, so many measures, outcome measures, scales have been developed on white people and then applied to black people. And then, and then wondering why, I mean, you know, the, the side disciplines as a whole, psychology as well as psychiatry have a very bad history in this respect of measuring, measuring black people with white scales of intelligence and finding people to be wanting. To be white means to be the reference population in research terms, the norm against which the other is measured. To be white means not having to think about your race every single day. It means going unnoticed into a room full of white people. It opens doors to work and opportunities from, from within academia and elsewhere. Whoops. For, for a freelance survivor researcher, it means being offered work on a range of topics, as I said, not being selected solely. So this is, this is a piece of, um, this is a piece of research I was involved in many years ago, as you see, 20 years ago, from the start of, so the, the, the basic, the research was to look at service users, survivors' experiences of living with mental distress and to understand people's strategies for managing and coping. And in that piece of research, we included two researchers, one uh, black British man, Colin King, and one um, South Asian woman, to in interview people from their own communities. And, and this is Colin writing in, in, the, um, in one of the chapters in this book. He said, from the start of this process, I communicated my feelings of not wanting to be abused as a black male spy for the purposes of a white organization. And my aim in this project was to ensure that the confidentiality of black users was preserved, both professionally and politically, and the information obtained should not be used to reinforce historical stereotypes around black people in mental health and psychiatry. Um, so I'm not sure that that was achieved in that project. And, you know, I still feel a sense of wishing to, if you like, redress that. But I have since come to understand the context in which we carry out this research and, and, and why we are perpetuating, if you like, that, the whiteness within um, society, but within psychiatry, mental health and in research. And research, to me, feels like a particularly extreme end of this in many ways, even though, but anyway. Um, so I, th this slide, I'm just touching on a very small number of things from the history. And I'm, there are many books that give very much more information about this. But it is important to understand the context in the history. And Harry pointed that out um, quite uh, powerfully in his presentation. The history of psychiatry is that diagnosis is not, is not scientifically reliable or realistic, or, or it doesn't have um, a credibility that kind of goes beyond its own context. So I was very taken with the quotation that Harry used at the very beginning of his um, presentation about the outcomes being the outcomes the system is designed to achieve. So if we go back to the diagnosis of the runaway slave, drachatomania, but that's one example. You could dismiss it as a single example of a diagnosis that was designed at the time of slavery, but no, schizophrenia continues into um, present day as part of the racism. Before the 1950s, uh, schizophrenia was largely a diagnosis given to white middle-class women, weirdly, and now, since the 1950s, it's become a diagnosis that predominates amongst black men. And Jonathan Metzl has written very, very well about schizophrenia and racism, the protest psychosis. So with the civil rights movement, schizophrenia became more uh, commonly um, diagnosed among black men. So yes, as Harry's pointed out, the continuing overrepresentation of, of um, black and minority ethnic people generally in mental health services, but particularly uh, young black men. The research in which we are, um, the research we are using, who measures who and how are the measures produced. The research often, excuse me, I set a timer for myself and didn't realise it would ring. <laughs> so research often omits people from black and minority ethnic communities. I have been around tables so often with researchers saying, oh, we couldn't find any black people. They didn't come forward to the project. They didn't, you know, they didn't volunteer themselves. We don't go out, we don't make the research. It, it is white research. If it's white research about white people, then maybe we should just say that. But we're not, 
actually going out to find people, making research relevant to the communities if we want to address them. We should be working in partnership in order to make sure that this research does do that. So research often omits people from different communities, black communities, or it examines them from a white Eurocentric perspective. Obviously, you know, I don't have enough time to cover all of these things, but what we do know is that there are significant public health implications of believing in racism and its impact and turning, I believe, a lot of the research in a different direction. So Jayshree Kalatil, again, from her presentation, White Privilege and Knowledge Production, the issue of inequality and exclusion um, of, of BME service users and survivors from spaces and processes of collective knowledge production is not one that only BME service users and survivors need to think about and articulate. It's an issue for all of us. All of us who are in positions to lead research and promote survivor research within university spaces need to start acting on our commitments to equality and diversity and start asking difficult questions about how power and privilege works how knowledge is produced and who is involved in it. If not, survivor research, like other research, will continue to represent only those of us who are already privileged in terms of our socio-cultural backgrounds and perpetuate the systems of inequality already in place. So potent, I, think, I think survivor research has significant potential. I think it has, because it develops opportunities for people to tell their stories and to be heard, and for people to make sense of their identities through this kind of research, I do still believe very much in the potential of survivor research to continue to open up the spaces in different ways. It's creating a space for experiential knowledge, which I think we need to hear because I think it's a really significant part of understanding madness and mental health. And it's a re and, and essentially retaining an awareness of white privilege and of voices that remain marginalized. I think in the survivor service user world, because we don't feel privileged, as Harry pointed out, it's very hard to raise issues of white privilege with white people who do not feel privileged. But we have to do it. We have to understand that when I walk into a room, I am practically, you know, a room, at, let's say a conference or a research team. I'm sort of invisible in the sense that nobody turns around and looks at me thinking, you know, the colour of her skin. It, because I merge into the group, I merge into the crowd sometimes more than I would like to be honest <laughs> but that's another machine just so some of my concluding thoughts I think it's really important to keep listening and thinking and talking and reading we have to become literate and articulate about white privilege and racism I'm very happy to share my slides and I have got some references at the end they may be a little bit about whiteness 101 but I think everyone has to start somewhere being aware of the scientific racism that's inherent in the side disciplines when we are working as practitioners, as researchers, important to be aware of that history, the legacy that still continues to this day. Being prepared to question and challenge in white majority forums and debates is one of the things that I set myself as a challenge and it's not easy. Being aware of and making explicit the theoretical underpinnings to what we do. So I have learned a huge amount from fellow uh, survivors, service users um, from black and minority ethnic communities about why they want to know what, where are you coming from in your research? What's your theoretical basis? Where are you, are you taking an anti-racist stance? Are you assuming that the diagnosis is real? So I've learned a lot from talking to people about that. And if research is done by white people on white people, how relevant is it? to the rest of our communities. And finally, white people recognizing our own power and privilege. How do we begin to decenter whiteness? And it's not an easy process, but we need to start thinking about it. We need to, as I say, start reading, thinking, talking to each other about it. I thank you for giving me this space today. Hi, Alison, thank you so much for that. Let me just uh, take your spotlight off there just a moment. Alison, thank you so much for that. That was um, really, really useful for, um, for everyone to see this morning. Um, I know you've got to shoot off um, at uh, 10 to 11, haven't you? So um, we won't take too long any questions. Um, there's a couple of questions in the, in the chat here, so we'll just get onto those in a moment. Uh, we just wanted to say, first of all, I think that was really useful for, um, especially for students watching um, on two levels, I think. Um, 
firstly to hear about survival research is um, certainly something that many of us may not be familiar with um, and actually um, I think recognising that that is a valid form of research in um, psychiatry and mental health and um, to understand the experiences of um, service users and of patients um, I think that's something really important to recognise uh, but also I think we touched on this before about um, whiteness um, for white people and I think actually um, one of the things that really came to mind when I, when I was listening to that is um, this kind of idea that you don't recognise your privilege until um, it's taken away from you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's certainly uh, very true, speaking as a white person. I think you, just, mm -hmm. you simply don't realise um, quite a lot of the time, um, but you certainly should. Um, I think also this idea of um, whiteness versus other, um, it, it kind of touches on that as well. Is And that's something that you explained so well for us today, um, is that you um, are part of the of the reference group you're not part of the other group um, and as are all white people um, and I think uh, and I guess I was what I wanted to ask you as well about um, we spoke before about essentially all research being white research um, and that actually this this plays into the problem a lot because um, we're generating it's kind of a self-perpetuating thing isn't it you know we're improving we're using white data and feeding that back into a system which is which is only helping white people. I guess my question is whether or not you think um, that is contributing to some of this, to these inequalities in, in psychiatry and in mental health. Mm, def definitely, definitely, because I've been occupying this sort of field of research for quite some years now. I definitely think that, you know, it's frustrating to begin with, frustrating that researchers almost um, rely on diagnosis as a given. Um, more than their practitioner colleagues, you know, so carrying out research where you're only doing this research on people with this diagnosis is very, very common. They kind of act as if that diagnosis is very real. And, you know, it often just isn't. So then you've got the sort of the, the you've got to unpick that, right? You've got to go behind that and say, don't you understand the, the, the racist sort of um, ideology that formed these diagnoses and therefore how doing the research in the same way as we've always done it continues to perpetuate that that kind of approach and I don't know I mean it's hard it's hard to break down those it's really hard to break down those norms mm, I feel like the, the awareness there is, is certainly the first step and mm -hmm. we've got a question here from the chat again this is uh, again from Felicia uh, Lazaridou um, it says, Dear Alison, awareness is whiteness and white privilege is indeed important for everyone. But beyond that, uh, what can be done to deconstruct whiteness and what must it be replaced with? Well, that is the, I think that's the base, that, that is the key question. I think you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I don't have a, a, a thought through answer to that. But, you know, being able to, white people starting to, to understand what privilege they hold as white skinned people in these forums is a really important part of it. I mean, even under COVID and I mean, disregarding, I mean, not disregarding, I keep saying the wrong words, but when we talk, when we walk, we go out on our walks, our, our walks. And we, I think when you think about the comforts that people are, you know, what spaces are people making? Who is making the space? Who is taking the space? Now this has been often, often a gender thing. We've often thought, oh, you know, it's men carry on walking and women step to one side. Think about it in race terms when you next go out on your COVID walk. Who is taking the space and who is making the space? Because so often we uh, white people assume we carry on walking when there's a black person walking towards us. That is such a, it, it's nothing. It's a basic part of, you know, our comfort in society in walking into spaces. I think it's really important just to think, begin to, I really haven't answered that question. Um, I think yeah. there are some really good people writing about white privilege and I would recommend Robin D'Angelo. And, um, you know, there are many, there are others as well. How do we deconstruct it? We have to decenter it and we have to, you know, people, who, those of us who occupy spaces of privilege need to work in partnership, need to open up the space for other people to come in who are not white and make sure that we are developing conferences in partnership, making, you know, I mean, that, that concept has, has gone by the board for a long time, I think, in austerity, involvement, involvement <laughs> of, of people from different 
um, communities has reduced massively, I think, because conferences have become more white, and more male. But I think, you know, we have to start looking at that again. Who are the knowledge producers? Who can speak? Who can and, and will speak in these spaces? I think we need to share the spaces more, you know. Mm, absolutely. I've um, got a question Sorry, here. I, really thought through answer here. <laughs> I think that's, um, that's really interesting. And a really interesting um, thing to look out for, I think. Um, even today, especially people who, who are unconvinced who are in that kind of acquiescent um, group is, you know, to walk down the street and see um, who, who moves out of your way. Mm. Um, this question here from Cassie Bow says, I heard about research that was being done for early intervention, te intervention teams, uh, why young black men weren't accessing services. Um, was it due to the info on the internet or word of mouth? Um, were they looking to improve access to the service such be culturally relevant? Um, does anyone know why this might be? And I think that has touched on a point earlier in the chat made by uh, Kirit Mystery, who's um, talked about the need for commissioning culturally sensitive services. So I guess uh, it's really a question about why um, our services and research, uh, why, do, why do they fail to be culturally relevant for, for certain groups, do we think? Mm. I'm doing some research, well, it's hopefully going to be research on psychological therapies um, at the moment. And that's an area that is very white uh, dominated. You know, it's, it's far less, as, as I think Harry Slides pointed out, um, people are, more white people proportionately are referred for psychological therapies than black people. And um, so it's, you know, just, just then to approach white people for their views about psychological therapies is a complete waste of time because we're not understanding why black people are not getting it. We're, we're, we're sort of, you know, again, it's unpicking, taking steps back in our research to understand the roots of where that research came from. Indeed, and this is a question here from Matt. Matt Iqbal says, um, question for Alison and Harry, uh, what does a good diversity and inc inclusion policy in a company look like? Does Harry have any thoughts on that? I don't know if Harry's, uh, Harry said Harry's got a web. Have you got any thoughts on that at all, Alison? Um, I think the organisation needs to look at itself. And uh, I think that's the first step is listening to its uh, own, the, the people within the organisation. You need to look at yourself first and think through why is this organisation so white? Are we appointing people who are just like us all the time? Uh, before you even put a policy together is to start looking at your own organization's sort of appearance and um, policies but Jeff listening to your own staff who are not white and you know understanding how it makes them feel I, I mean I remember talking to somebody who I think is on this in this, in this room today um, about you know what it felt like when she went to work in this very large charity entirely white young white people who didn't had never even begun to think about um, race or even you know the sort of issues that might have um, influenced how it how it felt to her walking into a white organization you're already on the back foot you know really sort of important issues about listening to people how it feels making explicit some of the issues that are different for people. Um, I don't have, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience because I'm um, independent. I've worked freelance. I don't have a lot of experience working on policies within organizations. Um, more I know about hearing what people say about, you know, working in a white organization. But Harry might have some. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so there are a couple of things I'd say. The first thing um, in terms of a good policy is to shift away from a policy that assumes that you can, through a dictat, state what's supposed to happen in an organisation. There's something called diversity of thought as well as kind of diversity of who we are. So a good policy will start by recognising that what we need to manage is the fact that people will think differently and have different perspectives on things and therefore what needs to be created is a culture and context where we can have those conversations in safety. So that's the kind of first thing. Um, the second is to have policies that move away from platitudes, but are kind of willing to get beneath the surface. Because like given with Black Lives Matter, lots of organizations are putting out statements 
but there's not a lot of appreciation of the fact that you know, people are still trying to work out what they're going to do. So there needs to be something in a policy that makes it really explicit that this is a journey. And then the third is policies that make sure, and as Alison said, that there's an acknowledgement that people have different experiences and that for people who are black and brown, they're likely to be negative, not just as a result of what happens, but all in, in the organization, but what happens in wider society and things that happened in history that will still stay with them. And that kind of be, be colonizing our organizations was kind of what I was hinting at about kind of, you know, looking at our education or the kind of underpinning philosophies of whatever sector we're in, a policy that starts by saying, actually, our ideas um, are built on racist notions um, and to kind of make that central in policy. So they're the three key elements. And then the obvious things that people talk about, about, you know, inclusion at all levels and you know, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. If we've just got time for, for one more question, Alison, and if you need to shoot off fair, uh, shoot off very soon. It kind of plays into the last um, question we had too, uh, which just says, uh, it's from Katrina uh, Carberry, which is how useful are white equality and diversity leads dominating black and ethnic minority support groups um, and setting uh, policies and practices? Just how, how useful are white and equality diversity leads? Oh, that sounds interesting. Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Sure, yeah. So the question is how useful are uh, white uh, equality and diversity leads? So that's people uh, who are kind of there to represent um, people in black and ethnic minority groups. How useful is it to have, um, mm. uh, to have white people leading those support groups um, and setting those policies and practices? I think it should be a shared. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I feel uncomfortable about that. I think it should be a shared role. I would prefer to see it at least shared. Yeah, mm. I think. Harry, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm really interested in the intersections. Um, yeah. I, again, I'm so, I knew Alison would anyway, so glad that was picked up. Um, so, of course, it's possible that um, you could be from a black Asian minority background and be homophobic or to, you know, be Christian and yeah. to be, yeah. um, you know, really discriminatory against other faiths or to be completely unable to take account of diversity or to not have even worked out your view on um, trans issues. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a complex arena, but to have not even bothered to engage with it and to just kind of say, oh, that's a different group of people. The fact is, is that people intersect, um, aspects of um, identity intersect. And I think it's wrong that we have a group of people involved in the arena who can help us have the conversations that get into this. There's also the issues of whiteness that alison has been exploring and how beneficial it can be to have people who are white who have done that thinking to support others. Yeah. Because there was a question that came up before about, well, you know, how do we avoid black and brown people being seen as the experts or carrying that burden yeah. of educating their colleagues? And if we're not gonna be relying on black and brown people to do that, we might need white people to do that. Finally, and I know you can say something, but finally, that kind of thing where as people work out their thinking, they may well ask questions that feel racist and really hurtful. And sometimes yeah. white people need a space where there's someone who's educated can kind of do that working out without black people needing to be exposed to you know, people figuring out their stuff, but also being inadvertently racist and therefore hurtful in that process of learning. The process of learning is essential, mm -hmm. but yeah, we don't need to see it all the time. Alison, you're sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I agree so much with what you're saying. I think so often we we put black people in a really double bind situation by expecting them on the one hand to be the people who raise the issue of race just because we don't. But then when they do so, we, we accuse them of, um, you know, always talking about race. I think, you know, that is one of the most difficult things, which is why it is so important for white people to share this conversation and to become more able to talk about it. I, um, on a journey. I'm not going to pretend that I am an expert in talking about these issues at all. I'm looking and thinking and trying because I think, you know, you, you can only be on a journey in this respect. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, over time that there will be uh, more of us, particularly in the cyber research world, who will be 
coming alongside us, but also in just the mental health research world generally, that we can make more of a more of an impact um, as we go along. But yeah, I think we need to be able to talk about these issues more.